Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. Alberta Senator Grant Mitchell was born in Ottawa, but raised in a military family, which saw him moving often all across the country. He had an abiding interest in world affairs and in politics, and went on to have a quite successful career in Alberta politics. He even served for several years as leader of the Liberal Party of Alberta. Then he was appointed to the Senate by Prime Minister Paul Martin, and Grant Mitchell joins me now to talk about life beyond politics. Senator Grant Mitchell, welcome to Beyond Politics. It's really wonderful to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. It's really wonderful to be here, Catherine. You are a, um, a senator for Alberta, uh, a former leader of the Liberal Party in Alberta, and yet you were born in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? I was born in Ottawa because my father was stationed here with the military. My father had, had been an officer uh, in the uh, Canadian military and was for 32 years. I didn't live here very long. I only lived here six months, and then we moved to the Maritimes, and eventually to Manitoba and then to Alberta, and uh, I've lived all across Canada. Isn't that something, do you remember, are there specific things that you remember as a kid from your dad's time in the military? I mean, was it, it moving that much must have felt um, tricky at times. It does, it, it can go two ways. Um, I think my, my sister probably be, became very shy because of that. Interesting. Uh, yes, I on the other hand became more outgoing and I actually quite looked forward with some excitement. We moved literally every two years. I've lived in seven provinces. Uh, I even li I, I lived in Montreal. My father was from Montreal originally. And, and uh, so I, I, I always had great anticipation. I think the one thing I particularly remember when you ask about a given incident was when my father went to Vietnam. I was old enough at that time to know he went with the Canadian forces on what was called the International Control Commission, where it was kind of a peacekeeping force that didn't work particularly well, obviously. And... Uh, but was was very very striking to me, and I um, at 12 years old to see your father go away to somewhere where you know he might not come back. Right, was quite a powerful experience. How long was he gone? He was gone for a year, and of course in those days um, we didn't have oh, of we course. didn't have Email emails and, and, yeah. and we didn't even phone. And uh, I have these beautiful um, handwritten uh, oh. letters on the air. You know the the thin blue paper. Yes. And I still have them to this day. And that's I, yeah, so I great. Them, yeah. Oh, I always think keeping letters like that. I mean, that's it's a completely lost art now, frankly. And yes. I still have letters that my parents would send to me, and I keep them in a box. The yeah, same that's way. exactly. And my wife has put them into a, into a, you know, a book, and and I I refer to them and read them, and they were really, you know, for a dad sort of giving you advice, from thousands of miles away. Uh, yeah. It was really, it's really a, it was a powerful experience. So I remember that, and I really remember him coming home. I remember waiting at the airport and seeing getting off the plane in those days and walking across the tarmac. So, Was your sister younger or older than you? My sister was older. Okay. And, and I have a younger brother as well. Oh, no, yeah. I have a younger brother okay. who uh, is pro sort of probably in the middle with uh, being outgoing. But, yeah. Uh, and what was your mom like? Because a, if you have one person in the military, it's yeah. inevitably the other person who has to deal with the moves and deal with the changing of schools and all the issues that go around with with those things. My mother was was very very smart and very very uh, strong, and um, you know we never felt I mean, very supportive and so on. And, and I can remember again that year when my father was away and the pressures that she was under and that she felt, but but she never withered under them. She was always very very stable and very strong and very um, yeah a leader in her own right. And she was very influential in my development as well. Did you re did you resent the the moves as a kid? No, I, I really didn't. I, I, um, I just uh, always had this sense of adventure and going somewhere new. And you can imagine as a, a child of nine years old moving to Shadow, Manitoba, where you're right on the prairie and, and we could go and uh, I didn't know at the time, but when I got there, you know, there's these there's, uh, facilities that out there in the prairie where you could, you could uh, play and, uh, and, and actually um, obstacle courses that they let us use oh, as wow. kids. and. So that was always exciting, and then to the Maritimes, we lived in Kentville and Wolfville and Halifax and and Oromocto, uh, you know, outside of yeah. Fredericton, and so uh, and then ultimately, um, my mother was from BC, so they retired to BC. So I I'd spent time in BC as a university student in the summers, and 
it was um, no, it was always really interesting to me to move. And I, I mean, there's, there's so much variety in Canada. It's almost trite to say it's such a remarkable place, but to have had living experience in all of these regions. Um, I was young when I was in Montreal, but I always felt that I had roots there because my father's parents were there. And so I have that sense of Quebec as well. And, and then to live, you know, literally from 13 years on in, in Alberta. Uh, so I've had a really full experience, and I've always loved moving. Tell me about your parents in terms of their political activity, because you seem to have had one of those families where you had discussions around the uh, the dinner table that went more, that went beyond just the how was your day at school today kind of discussions. Yes. Well, my father, being in the military, couldn't join a party, and I don't know that he would have been inclined to, and I'm not sure my mother would either. Yeah. But we always had a sense of issues because my dad had been to the Second World War, he'd been to Korea, huh. he'd been to Vietnam, as I said. Um, we were always, and my mom was involved in this, we were always talking about um, fairness and you know justice and yeah. the big issues of the world. And it just seemed to be a theme in, in our, in our uh, family that these were things we talked about and thought about. Did they encourage you to get involved? Or was it more just a broader sense of the world around you? Yeah, it was just really a sense of the world. I had no idea that I would ever enter politics and, you know, until I did. <laughs> I, I studied political science. I think that came from uh, the sense of these, you know, the, of, of my father's background, my, the discussions with my mother and father around the table and so on, a sense of issues of things being more important than us as individuals, that, you know, there are bigger issues. Yeah. And uh, it was very profound for me that my father had fought in the Second World War and really the sense of of fighting that great wrong and and uh, has always been uh, important to me as a result of that so but there was no suggestion of active politics in fact I don't know that living in you know army camps where I was yeah. that I'd ever met a politician um, really so but I studied politics and then in my early 30s Teresa and I were starting to have a family and I I just one day started to it just came to me that you know, I've been very lucky to have been born in Canada, have the parents and the family and the experiences that I've had. I had a great education. I'd been in, I'd worked for the government of Alberta in, in Treasury and Intergovernmental Affairs, sort of central agencies that give you a sense of government. I'd been in business. And I, I said to myself, if, I mean, if people like me don't do it, who does it? Right. You can't delegate democracy all the time. I have a responsibility given these, given these advantages and this, this, these benefits that I've had. And that led to me going to politics. Did you, you said you studied politics, and I, I actually, I didn't know that. What made you want to study politics if you weren't considering a career in it? Was it just an interest? It was more public policy. Okay. You know, I'm really interested in, in just how do you make things work in a country and, and public policy. And I had this view of public service, again, because the military is public service. Of I had a sense of you know, my goal was sort of maybe one day to be a senior public servant, a deputy minister would have been really interesting to me. Right. But as Alberta turned, it was very business oriented and uh, so the idea of getting to business became more significant to me and then I realized that with government and with business background, now you, you really did have a, a chance to bring some experience to government, to, to politics that would be worthwhile. You talked about the fact that you had lived all over the country, and you probably could have chosen to live anywhere. I mean, you did. You, you said your parents retired to BC, and you had yeah. family who lived in Montreal, yeah. and you've lived all over the place. Why? Why did you choose Alberta? Alberta's just a great place. It was. It was a very exciting time, and it still is. But in the '70s, when I was, uh, that's where uh, where I was when I went to I did went to U of A, and yeah. so Alberta was just burgeoning, and, and we had. Peter Lougheed, who was a tremendous uh, uh, visionary and innovator and, and leader um, and who, who was bringing Alberta into its own and we'd found you know, our oil wealth and we were finding our place in the world and in Canada. And, and, so, uh, and although you know, Mr. Lougheed was a progressive conservative, I happen to be a, li a liberal. <laughs> I, I like to say he's probably about as liberal as I am in many respects. He was very progressive and uh, very... So that... Alberta was a great place to be, business, and, and, and the government was treasury and intergovernmental affairs were really powerful and exciting places to be, particularly intergovernmental affairs because of all the, the federal-provincial relations that were occurring with Alberta at the focus of it. So, and Alberta, Edmonton, Calgary, I mean, all of Alberta is just a great place to, to raise a family and to have opportunity and uh, great facilities, 
you know, the, the community league organization there is unparalleled for your kids' hockey and soccer and uh, community uh, neighborhoods. It was, it's a wonderful, wonderful province. You, um, you talked about that, that will to serve, uh, but you also had your young family at that point mm -hmm. in time. And was your wife quite as eager to accept this will to serve as, as you were? Yes, uh, Teresa is a lawyer who works in public legal education, edits a law magazine called Law Now, and um, so she's very in tune with issues, and, and she's, she's deeply liberal. You, know, I, I, <laughs> we, you talk about needing to share values in a, in a yes. successful marriage. Well, we do. We're both small L and large L liberals. So, um, so she was very, very supportive and has been all the time. And, and uh, now that our kids are gone, you know, we talk about almost nothing but politics. Yeah. So, so we share that, and she was uh, a wonderful, wonderful parent and uh, was able to really support the boys, our three boys, when I was gone so much. And right. uh, it would be very difficult to, to make that work if uh, you didn't have that kind of support. Well, and I think most successful um, political families do have that dynamic, that uh, the man or the woman who runs has a spouse who is whether they have their own professional career or not, is willing to make the sacrifices necessary to keep the wheels of the family bus rolling, so to speak. Yes, ab absolutely. And uh, Teresa did that, and the, the job that she had was had some flexibility and, al and allowed her. And I, I mean, I'm grateful forever for yeah. the fact that we just could I could not have done what I've done and what I've been able to do if it hadn't been for the support of Teresa. Was it a sacrifice for you as well, though, on the family front? Uh, I think you do. You know, I, I think back and, and I, I missed things, and I feel, you know, you have, you have that sense of, uh, I don't know that it's guilt, but emptiness to some extent that you weren't there as much as you should have been, and, uh, and then you really start to crave grandchildren. You get to my age, and you can get, <laughs> you can get redemption. And, but the... But the <laughs> Uh, so I feel that a little bit. You, but I, but I also think that the the boys, our boys, would tell you that they, that they made sacrifices absolutely. And I'm sure on the school ground there were times when, in elections in particular, when they would be a focus of attention in, in a way that wasn't particularly pleasant for them. Mm. But there was also, I think, they were also open to the world and to ideas and to to different people and different cultures and different ideas that really enriched their lives too and, and have made them see the world differently and think in a, in a, in a, in a bigger way about things other than themselves. And right. I think that's been really important. You know, um, when you ran, did you have the sense that it would go further than just being an elected representative for a specific constituency, that you would actually end up as leader of the Liberal Party in Alberta? When I ran, it was, uh, I barely had the sense that I would even have a chance to win. <laughs> I could tell you in the... Was it tough? Was well, it tough it was, to be a liberal? It was in a, it was in a, tough in many ways, although people have always been very kind to me. This idea that, you know, I like to say that there are two kinds of liberals, or two kinds of Albertans, those who are liberals and who have know, know it, and those who are liberals and have yet to be convinced. <laughs> so I, but I, um, I, you know, in my ride, we, we hadn't had seats in Alberta, as Liberals for 21 years when I started running in 83 for the 86 election. We'd had 5% of the popular vote in the province and we had only 5% of the popular vote in my riding right. in the election before I ran. Did and people tell you you were crazy? Some did and and I would I would sort of look at them and say to myself, you know, I know something that you don't know and I, it is that I'm going to win. I just had this sense that if I could knock on every door in my riding and over two years, I, I almost did that, uh, oh. over 10,000 doors, that if I could just have a few moments with each of those constituents and listen to them and ask their advice and demonstrate in that way that I respected their views and that I wanted to understand so that I could represent better, that, that we would have a chance to win. And, um, and that's, you know, I knocked on doors at 30 below and 20 below and pouring rain, and, and because of that, there was many, many people who came and worked. I mean, never would have done it, obviously, by myself, but right. many people, wonderful people who I, 30 years later, I'm friends with, who knocked on those doors with me. If you knock on a door at 30 below, and I literally did that, yeah. people will never forget you. And, uh, you know, it's a very powerful and uh, a very powerful message, and, and, uh, and it created a very strong relationship with my constituents. So just winning was yes. kind of the focus. And 
once I'd won, I had a sense that perhaps there was a chance that you know I could become leader and we could go on from there, and um, that's what happened. When the night that you won, yeah. had you worked so hard that you thought um, we're going to do this? Like you were confident in it, or was it still was it still a bit of a gamble? I we'd worked so hard, and I, as I say, knocked on almost every door in that riding, and many of them twice. Um, I, I, I had a sense that it was there was really a momentum. You know, we'd go down the street and get sign after sign after sign, and I would find myself running from door to door. So you you have a sense, and uh, uh, so it wasn't a surprise in that. I mean, in in that way, but it was it was just an amazing, wonderful it must have evening. Been. Yeah, it was just electric. It was uh, one yeah. of those times in your life, you know, that so grateful that I would be given the chance to do what I later, you know, what I got to do. And, you know, it's one thing to be um, a, a leader of a, a party um, in a province where, you know, there's a 50-50 chance that you're going to, that you can win and become premier. Um, and it's another to be in a province where the odds aren't necessarily stacked in your favor. And Alberta has not had a long track, ro track record of, of liberal premiers. No. You must have had to work so hard. I mean, you must have just been on the road all the time. Uh, yes. Um, I had the advantage of living in Edmonton where the legislature was. Right. So uh, as, a, as an MLA. Which is great because that, then you don't even have that commute other than the, exactly. the daily to work commute. And you can go home most nights before you become leader. And then, you know, you can go home for dinner and go back to it because we yeah. sat at nights as well. But, but I, once I became leader, it was very even more intense. I mean, I was on the road all the time. And... Um, you know, you talk about family and sacrifice, and I'll tell you a story that was very poignant and very powerful to me. Um, I'd been away for four years as leader, you know, more or less, and, and uh, I came back. It was 1997, so there was the election. And then, so after that, I had a little bit more time. And about three weeks after the election, I was standing in the backyard on the deck with Teresa here and, and Grady, our youngest, may have been six years old, here. And he said to his mom, Teresa, not me, he could have said it to me because I was, he said, Mom, has Dad ever been in the backyard? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so that kind of underlines, uh, you know, the intensity of that work. And I, you know, I have huge respect for anybody in this public life that I think uh, their families make huge sacrifices. And, and uh, most people who go into politics go into something for something other than themselves, right. contrary to popular belief, and they work extremely hard. I've always wondered if there's something that can be done to make politics um, seem just easier, I guess, on, on the lives of the people who do choose to serve. Because um, you look at the people who are commuting great distances mm. to Ottawa or even in a provincial riding uh, where they are having to, to commute to their... Um, to their legislature and, and the toll that it does take on families. And I think that keeps some people, good people, out of politics. And I've I, always wondered if there's something that can be done to try and make it a little easier. I think um, a subset of that issue is, is, is the impact it has on women and their ability to do politics. Yeah. And I've always been very interested in, in emphasizing women's equality issues and women in, in politics. And I, I think there are structural things you could do to make it easier for women because it just it is a fact that women take a greater responsibility generally in our society for raising children than men do and you know that's changing but it still bears differently i think on the two genders and i you could you can restructure the the sitting times you know uh, in alberta they don't sit on friday for example which makes it a little bit easier you get long right. weekends uh, you're still busy on those weekends but nevertheless you can you could have daycare facilities you could you could there are structural things you might be able to do from yeah. that side I think it, it 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 is a very difficult life it's also a very uh, stimulating and rewarding life generally and it while it's hard because there's tremendous commutes if you're in BC or in the Yukon right it's also um, it's not like it it grinds you necessarily because it is so interesting and so stimulating and you have a sense of purpose. I, I feel like I'm a bigger, better person when I'm in politics. I know that would sound strange, but I'm thinking about things that are bigger and beyond me in a in a, a much more purposeful way sometimes than I would be if I'm not in when I'm not in politics. And so you have that 
that reward every day when you're a politician. You went back into the private sector after you mm -hmm. left politics initially. Um, was that, did you have that same sense that you were doing good things for the world when you were back there? I mean, was it, or, and was it desperately boring <laughs> no, <laughs> after the schedule you I kept? Have, I have been so lucky in my career. Every time, you know, that I had to make a change, there's always been something I've been interested in doing, and so I became a stockbroker. Right. And um, I was very, I, again, a sense of purpose, because while I wasn't working on a society as the whole, I had clients who, you know, I, I, I liked very much and who I felt a real responsibility to, and I really felt I could, I could work with and help. So I fulfilled that, that need, that sense of purpose, it's more specific, and it's it's not as uh, it wasn't as intense as a political life is. So it's very different. But uh, I wasn't uh, I was ready for a you know I was tired. I mean, being a leader of yeah. an opposition party, being a leader of any party is very very difficult, no matter what its stage of development is or its stature. But being an, uh, the leader of the opposition or, a, or an opposition party is extremely difficult because you uh, uh, you know you're. You're, you just it, it's just a very intense place to be and and it was time for me to change and spend some time with my family and kind of regroup uh, financially and yeah and so that all worked out really well when you got the call to become a senator what was your reaction well, that was um, I had very little anticipation that that was going to happen it wasn't something you you apply for that's for sure and uh, so I got I got the call from uh, from um, I, from the uh, senior assistant to the prime minister early in the morning at my office, and I, and I just didn't leave. He said, "Would you accept a call from the prime minister in the afternoon?" And I said, "Yes, I would certainly." And if he, if he phoned you and asked you about this, what would you say? And I said, "I'd be very happy to do that." So I, I literally didn't leave my office for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then the no phone bathroom ran. break, nothing. nothing. No, I just Not was, I out. wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> And uh, and then uh, Mr. Martin called and and asked me if uh, you know if I would like to serve in the Senate and of course I was just absolutely honored to do that and and every sense of uh, anticipation that I had about that has been fulfilled. But I know the Senate has has certain uh, difficulties in people's minds and so on. But the Senate is a remarkable institution that does remarkable work and with you know quite apart from me wonderful people and. I think one of the, what somebody said this to me, and I think most of us don't realize that the parliamentary system of government is the most successful system of government on the face of the earth. It's lasted for 900 years because it works, okay. <laughs> and it works for all kinds of reasons. There's elements in it, one of which is that it really emphasizes opposition. So that if you are a minority, or you are, you feel you're on the outside, or somehow you're there's somebody in there, even in question period, which seems so unpleasant. There's somebody in there yelling for you on your behalf. And that is a real release in a society for people who have tensions about how it's working. And it's also a very positive force for reconciling views. And back to your point about, about how you know, could you make politics better. I know people get the feeling, particularly because what they see is question period, that question period is horrible, it must all be horrible. Question period is 45 minutes a day, and in fact, if you're not up there, you know, asking or, or answering, it's probably not all that horrible, and it's not even as bad as I would argue as people as it looks on television. Right. You get the sense they're yelling uh, because, you know, they they have to yell to be heard in there in a right. way because it's a big room and it can be noisy. But uh, it's um, the fact of the matter is that that the parliamentary system is very very powerful, very very successful, and the Senate has been a really important part of that. There's all kinds of issues that we've developed in the Senate that don't have a political constituency, you know, an identified one that would be as appealing to an elected representative, mental health. Yeah. You know, the work that was done there, uh, palliative care, uh, the work on that. Um, uh, you know, a conservative senator who headed up a committee that, that recommended the legalization of marijuana. You know, when would that ever happen? On the other side, sure. you can listen. The, anybody who comes to our committees sense that there's a, a much less political tension and a much different Sober approach. second thought. There you are. Yeah. Sober second thought, yes. Um, you were an intern, is that right? Yes, yeah. And, and there's an interesting story about the fact that you're now sitting in the seat yeah. uh, of someone you once 
intern for, is that right? Yes. Did I got that right? The parliamentary internship program has been around for over 40 years and it's sponsored by the Canadian Political Science Association and by, in those days and probably today, insurance companies funded it. Ten graduates a year from Canadian universities and Canadians and they, mm -hmm. there was people who graduated from other universities as well in my group um, are, are brought to Ottawa and you work half the year on each side of the house for a backbench MP. And I worked for uh, um, two francophone MPs because I was wanting to learn French. And uh, one was the head of the Creditiste party, um, Andre Fortin, who later, un very unfortunately, died in a car accident driving home from his, oh. you know, to his constituency. But Amyard Corbin was the liberal who I worked with. And when I arrived here, he was a senator. And uh, so we worked together for four or five years. And then two years ago or three years ago, he retired. And I asked if I could sit in his seat, uh, so I sit in, in the seat that he had. Isn't that uh, something? Yeah, That's a really, nice story. Really a nice, yeah. uh, sort of a, a full circle. And he's a, just a wonderful man, is a wonderful man and a wonderful person. And uh, I learned a lot 36 years ago from him, and I learned a lot when I came back to work with him in the Senate. You um, have a whole side life, too, as far as I've understood it, in, in a, a more active, uh, physically active sense. You were a triathlete. Yes. You've competed yeah. in Ironman competitions. I have. Hawaii and Penticton. That's Canada. really impressive. <laughs> Thank you. That's yeah. quite something. Yes. Uh, where did that interest come from? Was it just uh, a release from the type of work that you normally have to do and burning off steam? Or? Yeah. I, uh, there's also a political connection to that, and I'll tell you how that occurred. But my... Um, my father was a, an infantry officer, so he was always very fit and a runner. So I, and I always liked sports, and I played all kinds of sports with him. And you know, we always had soccer balls and baseballs, and so I was always very athletic and and uh, not particularly you know good at any sport, but liked to play them all. And uh, he was a runner, and I and I began running. And then I'd always kind of had an interest in triath triathlon for whatever reason. It was kind of out there in the you know in the world and. But I couldn't figure out how to get the biking done. And then I became environment critic in, uh, in, uh, in Alberta and I at the legislature in the late 80s. And I thought, you know what, I, I should be riding my bike to work. So I started riding my bike to work. And that's how you got the bike. And that's how I got the biking part. And then uh, I went from there to, uh, I rode, you know, I rode not every day in the winter by any means, but I rode year round and wow. for quite a while. And then uh, that began to build a level of fitness. And then. Um, I, my, our children were young, so you know you could sort of work your training around sleep times. And I rode early in the morning, and, and often ran early in the morning and late at night. And it just filled uh, a need that I have. I need to. Do be you still active. do it? Well, I can't run anymore because uh, I've kind of worn a knee out. But I yesterday or Sunday uh, this week I rode 55k in uh, with my no triathlon kidding. training group. And oh I, my gosh! I do a lot of uh, I do. Yoga almost every day when I'm at home in Edmonton. I do moksha, which is Canadian made yoga. Yes. It's made in Canada. And I find, I wish I'd done that uh, actually all my life because that's very physical and very, uh, it's a stress reliever and it's just a great uh, form of exercise. Oh, you've got a well balanced life. Thank you. Seems yes. Well balanced uh, life. <laughs> it doesn't always seem that way. No, I'm so. sure. Well, I'm, I appreciate, given all that you have going on, that you would fit us in. It was. A true pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you today. Well, I've watched your show for a long time, and I was really, really excited to be invited, so thank you very oh, that's much. That's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Catherine.